Hello, everyone. Uh, first things first, I'd like to thank you for coming, because I know it's late. I know it's the last day, essentially, of LinuxCon. And you still came, so <clears throat> thank you very much for that. Um, my name is Tom. Um, I work at Intel in uh, Gdańsk. Uh, <clears throat> we are a team uh, which is devoted to persistent memory programming, basically. Um, as you can hear, I'm not really in full health. <coughs> I did everything I could so that I could stand up here and give you this speech. I've literally taken all the drugs I could take. And by drugs, I mean ibuprofen and uh, something for my sinuses and not crack. Um, that was actually was a multi-layer joke. Um, if you're interested in the bottom layer of the joke, uh, come to me later. Um, <coughs> so, uh, the ideal way I see this presentation panning out is that I show you a couple of slides, not too many. I give you some specifics, then you start arguing, talking, and then 45 minutes later, without me actually doing anything, we can go grab a beer, and then we can talk about persistent memory again. And that's probably not going to happen, um, unfortunately. So, how many actually of you have heard of persistent memory programming before Linux? I'm not talking about you guys, because you work with me. Um, uh, so, three, three of you, four? Uh, okay. Not bad, not bad. Um, so, the follow-up question is, how many of you have actually tried persistent memory programming? You know, like written code that actually works with persistent memory. Yeah, that's so. I'm still not counting you guys. Um, <clears throat> so persistent memory is hard, and I'm gonna try and explain some of the things to you as we go. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't wait until the end of the presentation, just shout it out. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll just ignore it, pretend I didn't hear it. And if I do, I'll try to answer it. So, uh, <coughs> feel free to ask. Um, we're going to start off with uh, a mandatory slide. I'm sorry, I know if you have been to the previous talks uh, by Maciej or by Piotr, you already have seen this slide twice, but I have to do this. These are the rules. I, I have to show it to you. Um, the next slide isn't going to be uh, about C or C++, as the presentation would, uh, the topic would suggest. It's going to be the model uh, devised by SNIA, which is the organization for uh, storage and networking. Uh, so they do with standards, basically. Um, <clears throat> if you want to know more about SNIA and what they do, go to their website. It's easy to find. So this is the slide. And uh, it presents a couple of persistent memory programming models. We're basically interested only in, uh, in this one, in the memory type of programming. What this model says <coughs> is basically, if you have a persistent memory aware, aware file system on top of a driver, on top of a persistent memory device, and you M map a file to your <coughs> virtual memory inside of your process. You can basically do loads and stores and flushes onto the memory device without really involving the kernel or the file system. Now, that's in theory. I don't know how many of you follow the Linux scalar mailing list. I reckon all of you. Um, there's been a discussion there that maybe this is not the best way to do this. And my answer to that is um, this thing, the whole programming model, the, the changes that the non-volatile memory brings, it's supposed to be a revolution, not an evolution. So maybe we need to go the extra mile to make this work. As I mentioned before, I'm part of the NVML team. We have a, a set of libraries uh, which were initially designed to work on Linux. Um, they tackle the problem of persistent memory programming, which is not a trivial one, 
and we tend to make it easier for the end user, <coughs> for the applications to use persistent memory correctly. Uh, this is another one of the mandatory slides I have to go through. Um, this is what comprises of the, and this is what comprises the um, an <coughs> NVML library. We've got uh, libpmem, which is basically the, 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 the bottom building block. It has all the low-level memory uh, manipulation primitives. These two, libvmem and libvmem malloc, they are designed for volatile use of persistent memory, because obviously that's a thing, I don't know. Um, libvmem block, it's a very specific usage. It gives you um, block access to a memory pool, easy as that, it's atomic, with respect to persistence. Um, PMM log is a <coughs> it's, it's an append-only file implementation, and this should raise a flag because it's written append mostly. Um, the mostly thing is because you can rewind the log, it's, but other than that, it's just append-only. And the most interesting library, the most versatile one, is libpmmobj, which is a, mm, an object store. As my colleague pointed out earlier during one of the presentations, it's not really transactional. It's not only transactional, because we also have an atomic API, but it's mostly transactional. Um, this is the last slide the, uh, on, you know, uh, without diving into specifics. This is the last general slide, I promise. Um, this is how libpmmobj looks like. We have a transactional API and an atomic API. And the transactional API is infinitely more versatile than the atomic API. Uh, so we're not going to talk about atomic. Um, as I mentioned, um, libpmm sits on, top, on the bottom side of all, almost all of the libraries. Um, we have internally lists, which we make available for the user if you want to use lists. Um, there's an allocator, which is at the heart of libpmm ops, And it's a very interesting topic in itself and I'm not going to talk about it at all. If you have questions about the persistent memory allocator, because it's, cause it's a fun piece of code, ask Piotr. Piotr, could you, you know, yeah, exactly. That's the guy, that's the allocator guy on NVML. Uh, if you have questions to the allocator, ask him. And that's basically it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story, because I think that presentations should be a story it's, it's late, and I don't want you, you know, sleeping here, so I'm going to tell you a story from, from C to C++, because this is a C++ presentation. But without telling you the pain points of um, the C implementation, you won't really understand why uh, we bothered with the C++ version. So before we start, there's one thing. Sorry, I'll be drinking a lot. Um, <clears throat> there's one thing I have to mention beforehand. Um, there's this concept in programming that we always take for granted. It's pointers. And as I said, um, <clears throat> the model says that you have to mmap a file. When you mmap a file, you don't really know uh, which virtual address it will be. You can kind of enforce it. Uh, with a mapping with a fixed flag, it's not really it's not really the most elegant thing to do, and I advise you don't do it at all. Uh, so this is a pointer in NVML. Um, this is a called a persistent pointer. Uh, actually, it's a persistent memory object identifier because it's PMM object. We do with objects. Well, basically, this is a pointer. We have a a UUID of the pool, which is basically a unique identifier of the pool. So it could be a set of files. It doesn't have to be one file. It can be many files. And then you have an offset within that pool. So it's a base pointer. It's an offset. Cool. But you see that there is actually no type information in here, right? There's nothing saying what type of an object this points to. So basically, this is a void pointer. Not very useful, is it? Because you have to cast it to the appropriate type, and it doesn't give you any uh, runtime type safety. So void pointers are cool, because they can be anything. 
who wouldn't want to be anything, you would like to. But in programming, we would like to have typed pointers. And, and this is one of the challenges we faced during development of uh, libpmm opt. How do we make a typed pointer? And this is what we came up with. It, it's basically TOID, and you give it the type, it's a, it's a macro. Because <laughs> uh, it's C. In C, we love macros. Um, so this is a typed object identifier. Um, the question we ask ourselves is, if we cannot embed the type within the information stored within the pool, how do we provide uh, type safety? Preferably, compile time type safety, so that you get errors. And uh, we did it with um, a lot of magic, basically. We took, we took some unicorns and rainbows and stuffed it inside the library. Um, truth be told, it's more of a witchcraft, actually, because you have to prepare for it. You have to get your chalk and you light your candles, draw the circles on the ground. Basically, what you do is you name all your types. Not a fun thing, to be honest. Because you have to name all your types. Basically, there's a, a root. I'll talk about that later. Don't worry. Um, you start the layout. You name all your types. Uh, assign it to a layout. And then you can start using uh, typed object identifiers. One thing to note is that um, while developing NVML, we didn't really want to change the language at all. We didn't want to provide custom compilers and add new pointer types and stuff like that. So we work with what we're given in C. And there's a lot of macros involved. I'm really sorry. We're, just, we're a C programmer bunch. We love macros. So this is, this is a part of the implementation. Um, some of you might have noticed that we maybe took the saying there's safety in numbers a little bit too seriously here because we do store numbers. Um, this here, this is basically a union. So you get the you get the PMOID. So this is this is what's stored on the medium. So a UUID and an offset. And we embed the type here. And then we can use the type. We provide you with type safety. Uh, all in all, this probably isn't the best looking code I have ever seen in my life. Yeah, thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it gets the job done. So when you compile you, and you mess the types, you get a compile time error that you're probably not using the right type for this. And it would be fine if it, that were all, but it's not, unfortunately. As I mentioned before, underneath, you still have a, an offset and a UID. You have, still have a void pointer. So to get the actual type, we had to do something more. Guess what we did? Let's get us what we did. I'm, it's, seriously, I'm asking. I, I even give you a hint. Macros. We added more macros. Because we could. Let's see. It's not something unusual to do. Um, this is what actual use of our library looks like. This is an example from our tree. So you declare a typed pointer. And then you have these little DRO statements. What they mean is give me a direct, so a volatile type pointer of the correct type from this thing here, and RO means read-only. <laughs> kind of obvious. Uh, there's also an RW type macro, which stands for... Everybody's asleep, really? Everyone? Read-write. <laughs> Basically, this is a const pointer. <laughs> Easy. Um, still, 
I think that this code is fine. It, it's readable. With little to no experience in persistent memory programming, you know what's going on, right? You've got, you've got checking if the, if the node is null. You have a the reference. It's everything, it's, it looks normal. Um, now, the question is, why the macros? Because obviously, we do have an API behind it, right? This is what the, the same example looks like using the API. Now, some of you might argue that we could make it this example more compact, and, and then it wouldn't look that nasty, but it wouldn't be an example then, would it? Um, one thing to notice, um, I cut it off at 80 characters. I didn't really bother, it goes on and on, it's probably somewhere and somewhere there, I don't know. A long way, either way. Mm. So, it begs the question, uh, is it at all usable? In my opinion, yes. But please do not try to nest too many of those, because uh, if you nest two or three, and you have to reference the, the inner one, it gets really nasty really fast. Since this is a C++ presentation, and I haven't mentioned C++ at all yet, um, let's get on to it. Um, so we have a couple of problems, right? I defined a couple of problems, and the question is, can we use C++ to somehow address those issues? And I say we can, and we did. Uh, the first one is the explicit type declarations. And frankly, I think that there is some feature in C++ uh, which we could use templates, I think, because they're inherently type defined. So let's use templates. We're still using the C API underneath, so we do have to have a number for the type to provide. But C++ comes to help here as well, right? We have the type ID hash code, which gives us a number, a unique number for a given type. It's what we wanted, right? Yay, C++. Good work. Um, and the other thing is, do we really need macros? Macros? This is C++, right? We hate macros in C++. We love them in C. In C, they're wonderful. But in C++, they're not really. There's one thing in C++ that could help us to get rid of the macros and its operators and operator overloading. There's a bunch of operators like member access and stuff like that. Why not use them? And so we did. This is what persistent pointer usage looks like in C++. And I dare say it looks more like programming than in C. Um, we have an allocation function for the, uh, for the persistent pointer, uh, which we also call a persistent pointer, obviously. Um, uh, since we're using C++11 and higher, uh, there's this feature called variadic templates. So what this does is actually call the constructor of foo and passes the arguments, because we can do that. There's no real issue here why we couldn't. Um, we have member access and function calling on the objects. It works fine. Here you can see that we create a bar object and give it to a foo pointer, so implicit type conversions also work. You can also do an array. Arrays are fine. Uh, for some types of arrays, we give uh, runtime bound checking, so we get a runtime error if you try to go outside of the bounds of the array. There's also the allocation functions. And this is starting to really look like smart, portal, smart pointer land. And it is, because it is a smart pointer. We tried to make it so that C++ programmers are familiar with it. So we tried to mimic, the, for example, the shared pointer. Now, having said that, it's not really a shared pointer. Because shared pointers were uh, <coughs> designed for lifecycle management. And the persistent pointer, it cannot, it cannot destroy an object on a scope exit, right? Because it wouldn't be really a persistent object. 
if you destroyed it each and every time it went out of scope. So, the question now is that you know all of this, right? I went through this. Is it usable? Let's go. This is the same example I showed you recently. Uh, you should remember it. If you don't, go see a doctor, because that may be an issue. Um, and let's see like, what the same example looks like in C++. Better, right? Let's look at it again. This is, this is normal C++ code. Sure, it has a little bit hidden in this, in this auto, but this is C++ 11. Let's use the features that were given. Uh, the only hint that this is, in fact, persistent memory programming is the, is the pool parameter, which tells you that maybe this, this is sort of persistent memory stuff. But other than that, it's, it's just normal code, right? We had this nasty um, DOE this null macro here. And here's just a comparison to a null pointer. You don't really need to reference it. It's just a member access operator does everything for you. It basically, it does more, but we'll get onto that once we get two transactions. So, question to me is, to you, sorry, from me. Is this better in C++ than it was in C? At least one of you raise a hand. Thank you. So, I kind of agree. I, I understand the rest of you are C fans, don't really like C++. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I say this is a win for C++, but not all that glitters is gold, so there has to be a downside. Sure there is. Uh, basically, the main issue is we don't allow polymorphic types inside the pool. That is because uh, v tables are runtime data. That's one thing. And second of all, there is no well defined layout of v tables in the standard. It's implementation specific. It could be anywhere, it could be anything. And uh, since we don't add anything to the language and we support any compiler that does C and C, we have no way of rebuilding the v tables on each reboot of the pool. Of the program. So, sorry, no polymorphic type. The thing is, it, it probably can't be, it, it probably cannot be really because uh, the question was sorry, I'll repeat it can, it can it be used to share the pool between Windows and Linux? And given that um, the alignment of structures is different in Windows and in Linux, uh, it cannot be. Can we turn on the mic? Yeah. Is, is it on? It's on. Hi. Yeah. So uh, if you're not sharing with different ABIs, yeah. then the second issue that you pointed out that the V table is not specified in the standard is not an issue because it is specified in the ABI. Um, in the ABI, uh, of which compiler is it? So the point is, if you have the same ABI that allows you to have same alignments of the structures, that means your V table is also specified in that ABI. I'm not right. going to argue about that. that. That might well be true, but I think it it's compiler specific. I, I believe it's compiler specific in the implementation. So we're talking. This is Linux con. Yeah. All the compilers on Linux use the same ABI for C++. Yeah, right now. Right. Yeah. It would only be a problem if we stepped outside of, of, of Linux. So if we went, for example, for Solaris or... or uh, and, and we're not saying that cannot happen, because yeah. we, we are doing a, a port on Windows. So, um, and that's one thing. And since it's, uh, it's not in a standard, you can't really rely on it, because that yeah. might change. True, but you can't rely... The C standard doesn't specify alignment either. Right. But, so we, do check yeah, but we do check alignment. Yeah. On My point is, you're depending on an ABI. I understand your problem, and it wouldn't solve the first problem of the address anyway. So, it's, it's, um, it's far safer to just forbid polymorphic types than... Yeah, you would have to do it anyway. I understand. I'm just yeah. criticizing the second point. Okay. Sure. Fair enough. Um, 
there's also another issue, and this is, this is actually taken from the standard, so I think we're not going to argue on this one, um, is that the point is that the hash code is guaranteed uh, to be consistent within one execution of the program. And that really doesn't help us in any way. I know that right now it works this way, so we're safe, kind of, right now. But if we wanted a permanent solution, there's some fix in the standard saying that some way of generating the hash code should be name and, I don't know, member mangled or something like that. Um, so there's downsides to all the stuff I just told you. It's normal, there's upsides and downsides. Um, the next thing I'm going to go through are transactions in uh, libpmmobj. Um, I'm going to introduce a couple of concepts and then, as always, go with C++ and see if C++ can do better. So transactions in um, libpmmobj have ACID-like properties. The key point is the like here, because um, they are atomic in uh, respect to persistence. Um, we provide consistency of our metadata. The consistency of your data is your problem if you mess it up. Um, for isolation, we do provide you with primitives and, uh, and an entry point where you can synchronize your access. And durability, well, this is called persistent memory, right? If we didn't have durability, then this wouldn't really make much sense. Um, <clears throat> so underneath transactions, you see exceptions. And by see exceptions, I mean long jumps um, to handle the error cases. So this is what it looks like using the API directly. Um, you first set jumps, so save, save your environment. Normally, this is the way you do it. So um, you then handle the error, the error case. Um, you have to end the transaction in case of an error, kind of counterintuitive. Then you can start the transaction. This is the, this is the end synchronization entry point I told you about. You can provide logs here, which are held throughout whole, the whole transaction. Then you do work. Like it's just like about no, 15 lines of code of work you can do here. And then um, you comment the transaction and you end it. And this looks, this looks bad, if, my, if I might say so myself. Because you handle the error case, then you begin the transaction, then you end it. It's just, it, it, it isn't, it, the flow of the application, the flow, the flow of the logic of the program isn't, isn't nice, isn't top to bottom, it's randomish. Um, so, you already know that we have a C implementation. We are C people. So, guess what we did? Macros. <laughs> yeah, we did macros. Because we love macros. So, we did macros. Sure. Um, we hit the whole set job stuff in the TX begin macro. You can still provide the, the logs. It's fine. Um, you can ask, what about the error cases? This is how we handle error cases. We give you an on board section, and it's optional. You don't really have to have the on board section. There's also an on-commit section, and finally, if you need those. Um, the only, this, is, this, is, this looks cool, as, because you hit everything, and it's clean and nice. The only thing that isn't nice is the, the TN, TX end macro. It has to be there because this is basically a glorified switch. That's, that's all it is. So we have to have it here, unfortunately. So we had, we had the, the, an ugly looking API with X with macros. Everything's fine, right? Wrong. Because um, even though we fixed it, it's, it's still error prone. I told you that uh, underneath the transactions use uh, C exceptions long jumps, and there's this, this, this tiny thing with long jumps, is that 
they mess up your registers in the CPU. It's most unfortunate, but it does. So let's look at an example, because everything is best explained. And an example. Uh, you, have a, you have a pointer. It's called bad example. If you, if you expect bad example to be well-defined and usable, for example, on, the, in the, on a board section, nah, it's not. Because we're going to long jump. And if I were a compiler, this goes into a register. You're going you're gonna to use it frequently in the function. I'll put it in a register. And afterwards, you're like, I don't know, undefined behavior land when you try to dereference it. And the bad thing is, you don't see it, right? There's no, there's no set jump, there's no long jump. It's, 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 it's here. We did you a favor, right? We hit the set jump in the, in the TX begin macro. Good job, us, right? So this is, actually, uh, uh, this is actually from our man pages. This is an example from our man pages. So we have it in our man pages. We have a blog post on it. I reckon this is, this is, this is recorded, right? So it's probably going to go to YouTube. And uh, frankly, I don't think there's more we could have done. I, I just told you about it, right? Feel warned. And I still think people are going to find this bug. It's, and uh, the on a board uh, section, this is like 1% you know, case where you fail transaction. Good luck debugging that. It's not an obvious one. Um, so how do transactions work? Ooh, I have to speed up. Um, so how do transactions work in libpm -Alt? We basically snapshot stuff. Um, but it doesn't happen automatically in C. So you have to tell us when to snapshot and what to snapshot. And I, I think that it's probably the biggest pain point in this whole API, macros, um, is this TX add. Because you have to remember. And remembering isn't something we do good. Because we're lazy people. This is a digression from me. Um, laziness isn't a bad thing. Not in my book. You, you know the saying that if you have to do something more than twice, write a script? Because we're lazy people, right? Laziness is what got us here as a society. Let's see this? This is a remote control. I, I could be standing there and pressing space or something. But I don't. It's because I'm lazy. Um, you know what was the prototype of this? Children. True story. You had a TV remote. Before you had a TV remote, you had children. You told your kid, basically, go change the channel. But we were too lazy to do that, were we? We invented remotes so that we didn't have to talk to our children. Yeah. <clears throat> lazy bunch. And it's a good thing. I say it's a good thing. Yeah. We would be, you know, using sticks and stones to get our food if we weren't lazy. Um, end of the digression. I don't have time for any more. Um, so basically, if you forget this uh, and, the application and the transaction fails, this won't get reverted. You'll either have the change or don't have the change. Depends on cache pressure. Um, once again, not a really fun thing to, to debug. There's going to be a talk later on uh, after this by Krzysztof. Uh, we did some work into dynamic instrumentation. Um, so you all know Valgrind, right? Yeah. So we wrote a tool for Valgrind to detect this stuff to help you debug these kind of errors. And I think it's cool. Helps a lot. Um, so uh, I've been pacing a lot, haven't I? Back and forth. That's a habit I picked up in jail. Um, kidding. <laughs> Mental hospital. Um, cool. So I showed you the problems with C++. Uh, with C, sorry. 
Um, C++ doesn't have those. It has other problems. Um, let's see what C++ does to alleviate these problems. Um, we have three types of transactions, which are actually two types of transactions. Um, two of them are scope-based. One of them is a function. I like to call them lambda transactions because that's how I prefer to use them with lambdas. Um, this, is, this is an example of a manual transaction. It's called manual because you have to do the transaction commit by hand. Uh, you might ask why commit and not abort by hand. It's far easier to make the programmer uh, handle the normal case than the exceptional case. Because if you forget this, everything fails, and you notice right off the bat that something's wrong. But in the odd error case, if you forget to manually abort, then basically a, a week or two debugging or stuff. Um, this looks nice, right? This, this starts a transaction. You can, you can put locks here as well if you want. Um, this starts a transaction, and once you once you hit, don't I'm, don't put anything after the transaction commit because that's I don't even know what will happen. Um, uh, once you're out of here, the transaction ends, and the main issue is that you don't really know how it ended because we can't call uh, throw uh, exceptions from a destructor. And that's uh, that's bad, that's bad behavior in any book I've written. I've re read, I haven't written any book yet. Um, so we have this uh, static function. It basically tells you whether you had an error in the transaction or not. And it's ugly, but I can't do anything about it, sorry. Um, you can you can nest transactions as well. This is also available in C. Um, and if you explicitly abort an inner transaction, the outer transaction gets aborted as a whole. Uh, one of the features. Um, so you still have to check whether it aborted or not. Um, now, <coughs> uh, you might ask, why do we have to commit manually? Why can't we just decide on when we go out to scope whether we can commit or or not automatically? Well, the issue is with um, the issue is in the standard actually. It's it's well known. It's it's that STD and caught exception. It's it's badly designed. They fixed it in C plus plus seventeen. They added an S here. It's now STD on caught exceptions, and it's fixed. You add a letter, and everything's fixed. Um, if you want to know more about this, there's a nice talk by uh, Alexander Andre, <coughs> Andre Alexandrescu. Um, there's also a, a standard um, amendment draft by Herb Sutter. Both of them very nice videos and articles uh, if you want to know more. So we fix this in C17. If you have a C17 compliant compiler which has the appropriate on code exceptions defined, you don't, really, you don't need to explicitly commit anymore. But we still don't throw an exception. So the get TX last error call, sorry, it's there to stay. Now on to the Lambda version, because we've got like 10 minutes. Have you got any questions? Because you're a silent audience. Really? No? Okay, let's go, because we've got 10 minutes. Um, the Lambda version, which I prefer, it's way nicer. This is how it looks like. Um, I added this line because you can't really allocate outside of the transaction, because it's a, a multi-step uh, thing. Um, we have a different API for allocating outside of transactions. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, you start a transaction. This is this is your function. It can be a, a normal function object. We don't really care much. Then inside of the transaction, you make changes. This is um, 
Remember what I told you that we're lazy people and it don't, we don't want to remember to TX add everything? This is, this is it's gonna get, get here done automatically. There's also, there's not only the persistent pointer, we have a, another template class and it's too much to, tech, to talk about in 15 minutes. But basically, this is gonna automatically add to the transaction so you don't have to worry about it. Um, all deletions are, can also be rolled back on a transaction abort. Now, the only thing <coughs> that I hate with uh, the Lambda functions, the Lambda transactions, I'm running out of water, um, is this thing. This is a lock. Now, why this has to be done this way is because we're using variadic templates and they have to be the last parameter. So you start the transaction, you do work, and then you mention the locks. Sorry, I couldn't do better. If you can, give me a, you know, you can issue, you can issue a pull request. It's, it's on GitHub. So if you can fix this, please do. If not, sorry. Um, <clears throat> one more cool feature of the Lambda uh, version is that you never really lose an exception. As if in an inner transaction something happens, this could be a library call, I don't know. Uh, something happens and you get an arbitrary exception, for example, std bad alloc, it's got, it gets waterfall outside and you can catch it here. I think it's a cool feature, necessary one. Nine minutes. Um, so to summarize, if you really want to have scoped transactions, please go with C++17, it's easier. Less, less error prone for you. Um, but I say go with the Lambda version. It's nicer, it's self-contained, it looks better. The only problem is with the logs. Now, this is the most interesting part. I, sorry, I, I, I had to put it in the end. If I put it at the beginning, it wouldn't make much sense. Um, we had this idea of using C++ standard library containers with persistent memory. And uh, to do that, we need to implement the STD, well, not the ad standard allocator concept, right? Which was designed not to do allocations, but to switch pointers. Hmm? Obviously. It's called the allocator to switch pointers. Uh, <coughs> this needed a little bit more work. Right now, we're targeting lib C++ and lib std C++ implementations of uh, standard library containers. And I think I've got most of the code on our site done. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like to actually use this. Um, so we have an std vector we provide it with our custom allocator, and then basically it's your regular vector, right? So, uh, you have the uh, vector here, it's my vector in the root. It's, this is actually working code, because that's why it looks so nasty. Um, uh, you open a pool, you take the root object, and then you can emplace back, push back, you can even iterate through the whole thing and do stuff with your objects. And it works. And it works because um, this is a vector. A vector are simple beasts. It's like in the GCC implementation, in libstd C++, it's like three pointers, I think, inside of the implementation. So this, this actually is atomic if you use it in a transaction and survives power failure. As far as I know, this works. For other containers, nah, not so much, sorry. Uh, so um, for leaf C++, I have basically all of the containers compiling. They're not power fail safe, but they do work in the optimistic case. Leap STD C++, however, not so much. Um, I don't know if you can see this. There's a little asterisk here which means that someone somewhere is expecting a normal pointer. And normal pointers, they don't understand persistence, they don't survive power failures, so 
libstd C++ needs a little bit more work. But that's nothing we can do, right? We send people to the moon and back. It's like 60, 60 years ago, 50. This is software, right? We can do this. I believe in us. Um, OK, so the, the main pros for this approach, containers are free. They're there. It would be a shame not to use them. So we decided we use them. It's, it's, not, it's not really free, because as I showed you, it doesn't really compile all the time. And we had to modify the implementation a bit for this to work. But it can. And I think it should. You've got a familiar interface. Everybody knows containers for C++. Everybody who's written more than Hello World in C++ basically used a container of some sort. Um, the implementation is well tested, not for persistence. Obviously, we have to add some tests for persistent usage. But other than that, containers have been used widely by almost everyone, and they work. And um, there are issues. This is unfortunate. I'm gonna. I need more water for this one. Uh, <clears throat> so there are containers which have internal data structures, like colors of the red black tree for the nodes, and those metadata they don't understand persistence. They don't know that they have to snapshot these themselves before they change. So we have to introduce this knowledge of persistence into other containers somehow, preferably in a standard way. By standard, I mean the standard. Um, as I showed you, there's also cases when there's a, a, a simple pointer used instead of the allocator traits pointer, which I think needs to be fixed either way even if this doesn't make any standard or uh, that isn't widely adopted by the community. I've, I don't. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm, yes, I'm sorry. Because I, I made a, a test in my tree that um, used almost all of the containers from C++11. And the vector works both for uh, libstd, C++, and libc++. This was, in fact, uh, so, yeah. Thank you for noticing. I didn't say that. Uh, no, it doesn't. It could do a rebind to a different type. It could use the allocator rebind. That's what that's what uh, libc++ does. Yeah. Um, but thank you for noticing. This is a good question. Thank you very much. Um, the other thing is um, we need some sort of layout versioning because we're going to keep it in persistent memory. There was no notion of persistent memory. And the standard doesn't say anything about layout versioning. So if you change the internal implementation of one of the containers and you open up the pool, it's not going to work. It's undefined behavior land as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that has to also be addressed in some standard way that we can check the layout version of the implementation. And lastly, we are currently um, working only on x86-64, because that's our target. Um, you see this, Intel? What can I do, right? Um, but this is open source. If you want this to be ported to a different architecture, please do. We're more, you're more than welcome. We will look at the code, we will merge it. If everything's fine, it doesn't break anything. So if you need this on PowerPC, sure. Well, maybe you do. And um, I've got like two minutes left. God, thank you that this is the last slide. Um, thank you very much for listening, um, for coming this late on the last day of LinuxCon. This is pretty much all I have right now. Um, uh, no, I have this one more. Um, these are some links if you, if you want to play with the implementation. This is, my, this is my private branch because obviously I cannot upstream this into NVML because it doesn't work yet. Um, there's uh, documentation and there's some blog posts on some of the stuff I mentioned. We also have a, a Google group. If you want to ask a question, participate in any way, please do. So thank you again. One minute. I'm spot on. Thank you. <laughs>